Column of Dust by Evelyn Underhill, 1909. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. To see more titles or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Middledorf. O oh, dust, have faith according to the term of this life's lease. Ere the corrupting worm have power to destroy the dust thou art, ere the dark rust of death can clog the engine of thy heart, great is thine honour, though thou walk in night, for fringes of thy darkness feel the light which was ordained to be when God the just, from shadow shaping thee, put trust in dust. Poem by Lawrence Hausman Chapter 1 the dangers of curiosity. O oh, loveless, hateless, past the sense of kindly eyed benevolence, to what tune danceth this immense? Hardy the Dynasts. I choose for the first act of my comedy the spectacle of a complete freedom, cruelly mated with an unquenchable curiosity. Such a liberty, clearly impossible to those who are fettered by the illusions of sense, is no natural prerogative even of the intangible and spiritual populations, constrained by the unceasing pull and push of that love which moves the worlds. These are drawn forward to the joys of a selfless adoration, or downward to the weary miseries of individual self-fulfillment those eternally opposing attitudes which an old-fashioned and clear-sighted theology has crudely classified as heaven and hell. This is the story of a being, a thing, a spirit, if you will, who loved nothing and therefore was free. It wished to serve neither its own interests nor those of the supernal light, and had no aim, only an aching inquisitiveness now the itch to know, coupled with the inability to care, produces there as here that restless and unsociable disposition which we classify as the result of an imperfect and egotistical education. There as here, it of course frustrates itself, since those who do not love can never understand. Hence this thing which was free was also ignorant and very wretched. The essence of this wretchedness was that because it, its ignorance and curiosity, had never been born, they could never die. They existed in the unchanging idea, without hope of release. Fortunately, it did not know this, for a spirit is as unable to conceive ending as man to conceive endlessness. This something, then, was alive and utterly alone, with a loneliness that is only possible to the disinterested and discarnate. There was nothing for it to do, since it could neither create, combine, nor destroy. It could think, but possessed no medium of self-expression, no apparatus by which it could be linked up with other lives, for it did not love, and being immaterial, lacked the senses, those oblique and clumsy substitutes for love, by which men reach out toward each other's souls. It came storming through eternity, through the crystalline spaces of that which is spaceless, and down the immeasurable periods of that which transcends time. It was isolated, energetic, and desirous of adventure, hungry, restless, and alert, a very vagrant of the invisible, avid of all knowledge, it perceived with a certain enjoyment the general movement and direction of things, the mighty figures of that dance of angels at which philosophy has tried to peep. But in the midst of the great pageant which the uncreated has dreamed for his own delight, it suffered a crescent and incessant irritation because of its own lack of understanding. The figures of the dance might be comprehensible, but the steps defied analysis. This uninstructed and therefore sceptical observer was angrily aware of certain complicated knots, turbulent manifestations of being, which rudely disturbed the symmetry of the whole. These he could not explain to himself, for they were ugly, disorderly, irrelevant, because they were inexplicable 
because he held them to be infringements of the plan they attracted whilst they disgusted him he wondered and watched forgot himself in the occupation a dangerous business for egotists of every grade hence there was born a moment in which he saw the many worlds and planes of being which from the standpoint of eternity are perceived under an aspect of great and serene simplicity interpenetrating one another and the world of matter turbulent and many-tinted crossing them all deep in this world of matter he identified that lawless and inconsistent element which had disturbed his first placid classification of things it was the faint distressful cry of life which came in a wailing cadence from that writhing tossing corner of the dream and broke the profound silence of reality within this disagreeable and meaningless maze of noise chaos corruption he presently perceived the earth as a peculiarly hideous and unresting tangle an irreducible blot upon that perfect process of evolving will whose shadow is the universe he saw it teeming with horrible little organisms which devoured one another in their ceaseless effort to preserve a visible and independent life but in spite of all their care and cruelty broke down after a few moments of meaningless activity and were dissolved into the dust from which they had come the sight was at once fascinating and revolting he wondered incessantly and with a growing irritation why being should manifest itself like that hence the image of the earth expanded until it filled his horizon in a fashion that he knew to be absurd his consciousness was concentrated upon it and the great and free vision slipped away from him as happens to us when we turn from the largeness of landscape to contemplate the inexplicable civilization of the hive thus this stupendous victim of petty curiosity growthless sexless eternal brooded over that absurd paradox of creation a temporal world founded upon the considerations supported by the illusions of matter growth and sex he heard the thud and surge of life which echoed through it and gazing into its heart saw the countless souls that clustered upon its surface each locked inexorably within the transparent walls of the flesh these he could understand for they too were spirits sexless and solitary things being as yet impervious to the false suggestions of appearance he was peculiarly susceptible to the currents which swayed them circulating in and about the visible world the subtle movements of expansion and contraction the loves and hates of the entangled souls he felt the curious withdrawal like the ebbing of a strong tide with which many drew back from life refused it as if dreading the impact of their waves of being against its shattering cliffs he felt the deadening stagnation of those others unconscious of life who drifted through it inert here and there he felt the pull of a vortex of power amongst these negative forces the eager vitality of those true lovers of life who accepted it rejoiced in it making a whirlpool in the spiritual sea crossing all these there was still another influence by which he was bewildered and abashed out of the turmoil dragged or distilled from it as it seemed by the very conflict of the idea with the horrible enigma of material things there was poured forth a strange ecstasy a vivid and penetrating love which pierced its way to the very heart of that divine reality whose calm as he had ignorantly thought was disturbed by the fretfulness of the world which lay upon its breast this love passed easily by the status of those spiritual orders to which he belonged and merged itself in that end of being for which all creation hungers eternally that such splendor and such fragrance should come from this loathsome and complicated dance of beauty and ugliness growth and decay was an exasperating paradox an indication of essential lawlessness which he watched with disapproval yet with a growing fascination he could not understand it could not leave it alone 
It excited him, as life excites the virgin who watches it with amazement and distrust. But presently the nemesis of the specialist overtook him. The transparent cell walls thickened beneath his curious gaze and hid the dwellers within. The illusion of solidarity surged mist-like across the landscape, dimming his sight. He had drawn too near, and could no longer see the life in its depths. That life was surely there, and the adorable idea behind it, but looking sedulously at the disconcerting appearance, its ineptitude, its cruelty, its unrest, he lost that consciousness of the idea which is the prerogative of the spiritual life. He was caught in the chains of his own inquisitiveness, and, weighted by those chains, sank from plane to plane of perception, ever narrowing the field of vision as he fell. The desire to know, that mortal enemy of the power to be, had forced him to accept the illusions that he despised. He was slowly and inevitably pressed into their deeps, concentrated, in spite of himself, on one point in the turmoil where, as it seemed, a tiny and individual fight was going on. There was a little furry thing that lived, and an agonized spirit which looked out at him through two green windows, solitary in the midst of all the other life, and greatly frightened. Something in the furry bag which held the spirit hurt dreadfully he wondered what it could be and why the prisoner within should mind so much whilst he was still absorbed in his own curiosity and the strangeness of this experience there was a struggle and a tremor that passed over the bag of fur and then a faint cry the light left the green windows a small matter in itself but bringing to this immortal watcher the appalling knowledge of things that could come to an end what a loathsome dream I am looking at, he said, and very naturally he determined forthwith to cease this foolish looking at a nasty and unprofitable world. He turned toward the great spaces, the empty and majestic real. But the real had withdrawn beyond his range. Then horror fell on him, and with it an utter helplessness, for he perceived that he could not leave off looking at the dream because... He was no longer looking, he was there. A cry came from him, a very bitter cry of wrath and fear. Ah, oh, what has happened? I am caught. I cannot get away. He had seen death, and suddenly felt on him the weight of the strange and dreadful fetters of mortality. End of chapter 1